Um, so tonight we're going to talk about Tales of Distribution. And of course I didn't get an intro, this slide's going to work really well. Um, I'm Scott Colton. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. I work for Poppet and I work on uh, core engineering. Actually, I'm now the tech lead for core engineering to do with cloud and containers. Uh, so I actually don't work on Puppet server itself. Um, I work on other products besides Puppet and the new roadmap and new technologies that we're going to bring out as other products besides <coughs> Puppet server itself. Um, you can find my GitHub at Scotty C or at Scott Colton. And that's my little boy who he's three now and he also wants to code. So he's got all the, the stickers and stuff on his laptop. He's just like <laughs> learning to uh, type at the moment and read. So it's pretty cool. Um, in this talk, what we'll cover um, is basically, I think it's already decided that containers will be the new unit of application. Um, I think that we're pretty much the ecosystem is moving towards or has decided that that will be the way that container runtimes, um, that runtimes of applications will be packaged. Um, but how will we distribute those? And there's basically, um, I've spoken about this before, um, I'm going to go through two choices. There are other choices, but I don't see them as, as much of a choice as the other two. Um, so what options do we have to solve the distribution of the actual container image or the image or the container? Um, so first of all, we'll start talking about the orchestration layer and why that choice is so important. Um, the network layer, um, so we have to have a look at securing communications between our microservices. And then persistent data, um, because not every application can be stateless. Um, some sort of state has to reside somewhere in applications. And if we need persistent storage um, with the orchestration layer, wh what, what do we have? Um, so in the orchestration layer, like this was actually, um, Brendan Byrne said this um, from Microsoft, uh, if the container is a new unit of application, orchestration should abstract away the complexity of underlying infrastructure. So basically what that means is you should be able to run any infrastructure that you want um, and you should just have an API that you can deploy an application to. Um, and I'll talk about a bit later, right at the end, where Puppet kind of fits into this. Um, but I think this statement is true. Um, from an application development point of view, um, they shouldn't care if it's running CentOS underneath or Ubuntu or even Windows. Um, they should just care about the orchestrator. The orchestrator should then um, take away the complexity of scaling. It should look after um, routing. It should look after a whole heap of sort of infrastructure tasks. Um, so I'm going to talk about two choices tonight. Um, and I see these as the main two. I know there's Mesos as well, but kind of, that's like a niche market. I'm going to talk about Kubernetes. I'm going to talk about Docker Swarm mode and the differences between the two. Um, although most people talk about them in the same sentence, they're actually completely separate um, entities and the way they solve problems is completely different. The thought process around the way they're developed is also completely different. And the way they're actually marketed now will be also completely different. And, and they're becoming more fractured as time goes along. Um, so why is the choice so important? At the moment as it stands, they have totally different um, methodologies of deployment. Um, so if you have a look at pods compared to services on Docker, they're completely different. They're no longer interchangeable. They're architecturally different from the application's point of view. So again, if you define an application in, as a deployment on Kubernetes, that won't work on Swarm mode. And the Docker Compose um, version 3 file that works on Swarm mode won't work on Kubernetes. So um, although the region, they both look YAML, they actually behave completely differently. The network stacks are no longer interchangeable. Um, so I think since Docker 1.9 went, over, uh, went overlay networks come out, uh, Google decided that that wasn't the um, networking methodology that they wanted, and the overlay networks was no longer used by Kubernetes. Um, they created the CNI interface, and there's a lot of network stacks that work around that. So that's, that's not interchangeable anymore. And the distributed key value store uh, is configure your own or um, is included. And that's a plus and minus depending on the skill set of your team and also what you're actually trying to run. So we'll go through that as well. So we look at choice one for the orchestrator is Kubernetes. I should have signed out a picture. Um, this is some pretty dry reading. This is what Kubernetes looks like from um, an architecture point of view. So basically it has the ideas of, of a pod, the kube API, um, then it's got like the kube proxy, kube DNS, um, that pretty much makes it up. You can bolt in things like um, Prometheus, um, CD Advisor, to get some sort of um, metrics and things out. Um, but basically um, you've got a controller node and you've got a worker node um, and they all bolt together. It's, it's pretty simple architecture. Um, but Kubernetes pods, don't look like anything that's in the Docker world. 
Um, so it's straight away when you look at it, you can see here, this is just a pod that deploys um, Elk. This is just Elk, that's all it is. Um, the, this will get Elk up and running for you. Um, but unlike Docker where um, you, you kind of, in the service world, um, call things a little bit differently, um, in Kubernetes, it gives you a lot more stuff around like things like metadata. You'll notice the API version is also met, uh, mentioned there. Um, the namespace that you actually want to um, logically put the application in. Um, then you've got things like, if, if it's um, privileged or not, is probably the same. Um, but the way you do container port is completely different. Um, and the image is, is the same because they both try to use OCI compliant images. Um, so this is like this methodology of deploying Elk would not work on Docker or Swarm, um, and then that's just for a single application. So that's it was just a pod, and if a pod has a failure, it won't restart itself; it'll just die, and that, that's it. Um, so then Kubernetes came up with services. Services define how many of the application you want running. Uh, in here, we're just running Vault, um, and we're just exposing the ports. Um, if this vault container died, it would then restart because the service would be defined that we want it one running all the time. So there's some sort of like self-healing here. Um, and this worked really well. Um, and this can work across multiple nodes or, or, or a single node. Uh, Kubernetes then was like, what happens if we want something a bit more complex in services? So they come up with deployments. Um, what deployments actually give you is multiple multiple services. So underneath deployments, it's actually running multiple services and those services are then spread across the nodes. Um, so it's like kind of a hierarchical layer of the way you deploy your application. And underneath services, sorry, I forgot to mention, are just pods, uh, multiple versions of pods running. Um, so what Kubernetes come up with the idea of a hierarchical data structure that you can then deploy applications with. Um, there's nothing like this within the Docker world. Um, Docker stack is a single layer. Um, there's no hierarchy of it. Um, there is like self-healing and um, desired state, but there's nothing as complex as what Kubernetes has um, deployed, um, which has it's, it's um, got its pluses and its minuses, um, especially when you're first starting to use Kubernetes. Or if you come from a Docker background trying to go to Kubernetes, it's kind of like a little bit complex. Um, you can see as well that this is still on uh, extensions beta 1. Um, I'm not sure if it's off yet. I, th I still think and deployments are on beta one, um, but yeah, it's this actually passes data down through to the service and through to the pod. So as I said, it's a hierarchical um, structure of how to deploy your application. Um, so that methodology is completely different to the Docker world. This is a major one that when I talk to um, customers or I talk to people that are having issues with um, Kubernetes, um, it always comes back to this. Um, it comes back to that they, uh, they're having issues with their etcd cluster. Um, and that could be whether they, they don't know who, um, what etcd is actually doing. They haven't thought about a backup or retention strategy for the cluster state. Um, or it's just they've got themselves into a state where um, the election has gone wrong and a node that knows about nothing has now become the leader. And that is by far the worst thing that can happen to you in the Kubernetes world. Um, so. One of the first things that, like when I started learning VMware, someone said to me, um, if something goes wrong in VMware, it's always the storage that made it slow. I found if something goes wrong in Kubernetes, it's almost always etcd in the back end. Um, so when we first started testing this, um, back before it was 1.0, we actually found that there was, uh, with, on AWS, <coughs> when Flannel was the only um, interface for etcd, um, uh, for networking, sorry, um, the network latency between etcd and flannel actually caused the um, cluster to keep failing over and re-elect the leader. Um, when we upped the AWS instance size, and I, I, I mentioned again, this is before Kubernetes 1.0, when we upped the instance size, um, then the issue went away because it had dedicated networking. Uh, so we traced it back to being etcd, between etcd and flannel and it was seen nodes as down. Um, so that's quite tricky, was quite tricky to troubleshoot. Um, and that's why we start looking at Swarm because at the scale that we were using in that uh, in my past job, um, we didn't need to go to the, for the complexity of uh, Kubernetes for that particular um, use case. And we also had a highly um, we were in health, so we had a highly compl um, like regulated compliance that we had to um, also adhere to. And some of the stuff in Kubernetes we couldn't explain, like removing the Docker bridge zero and then having to use Flannel and install stuff. Um, when the auditors look at, at the install process, they're like, why are you installing something, removing half of it? And that, and that was just the way Kubernetes was done back in the day. 
Um, but I have still seen issues with, with etcd, even running Kubernetes on top of Rancher or something silly like that. Um, I've seen people get themselves in trouble not actually knowing what etcd does and understanding what etcd does for Kubernetes. Um, they just like, oh, etcd is the back end for it. But without under actually understanding what the back end does, they don't understand the complexity and what it actually, the data it stores and the importance on the cluster that etcd has. Um, so if you're going to go down the Kubernetes road, I definitely would start with un fully understanding what etcd does. I'm looking at a backup and retention and um, strategy and also a resource strategy because if you've got a massive cluster um, of a couple hundred nodes, maybe a thousand nodes, and etcd um, goes a bit wonky, you want to know that you can able to restore the state of a cluster on another cluster if you need to and then migrate your workload onto that. Um, and as you can see here, it's based on Raft. Um, you have to use etcd for Kubernetes. There's no other like, choice you can have. Like, you can't use console or anything like that. Um, you have to control and etcd yourself. And it is API driven. You can actually tap into etcd yourself and get metrics out of it and, get, and check the health of it. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff built into Kubernetes to, to make sure that this is running properly. Um, but a lot of people just like, sort of glaze over etcd and think like, it's just a part of Kubernetes where it's probably one of the most important parts. So I really stress that if you're going to go down Kubernetes and use Kubernetes, um, understand what etcd does, understand the technology, and um, play with it um, outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Have a look at it as a distributed key value store, um, whether it's API calls to get applications or just to play around with it, and test it out and see, and, and see with it, because it is its own entity, and it has got its own complexities. Um, and you should really understand what it does. So now we'll look at trace two for orchestration, and we'll look at Docker Swarm. Um, Docker Swarm has a kind of a similar um, architecture as such, um, where it has the, the master and then a worker node. So it has that idea. Um, what Docker has gone for is a, 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 simpl a simplistic method of deploying the clustering. So they actually take the Raft consensus store and they, they, they look after that for you. Um, they encrypt it for you and they look after TLS um, comms between all the, all the, all the um, parts of the cluster. And that's all turned on by default. So one of the things that Swarm gives you is out of the box, a simple cluster that's easy to set up. Um, there's been massive conversations about does Swarm scale. Um, I know Docker internally has done um, like a, a proof of concept that it runs on 2,000 nodes, uh, 2,000 worker nodes. Um, again, it has the same limitations of the Raft consensus that Kubernetes does. You shouldn't have too many managers. Um, probably seven would be enough. Um, because the more um, cluster operations you have, the slower the consensus will be. Um, you can get yourself into trouble that way. But again, that's no different to Kubernetes because it's, again, using Raft. But for seven um, manager nodes, you can do 2,000 worker nodes. Um, Kubernetes, obviously, Google have done that at a much higher scale than that. Um, but the beauty of this out of the box is that the internal distributed store is looked after for you. The Raft consensus is looked after for you. And built into the Docker engine is a snapshot functionality and also a restore functionality. Um, so they kind of take out the complexity that etcd brings in um, to Kubernetes. And one of the things that Docker has really worked on at the moment is security by default, um, which on Kubernetes you can get the same security, but that's something that you have to take on yourself. Um, Docker ships with like, better security out of the box. Um, so they ship with key rotation straight out of the box. And Daigo um, from Docker, the head of security, has done a great talk about this on Container Camp in great detail. If you want to look, um, if you want to find out more about how this works, um, he done like a half an hour talk, pretty much just on this, on how you can like mitigate man in the middle attacks. Um, the CA can be hijacked, and you can still you, your cluster can still live. Um, you can rotate the keys on the fly. Um, how the key rotation's done, how it creates two CAs, trust, puts the trust between both, and can get a key off each and then removes the other one. There's a whole mechanism that's gone into this that is super, super cool. And you could do a whole talk on itself. I, I really, you should, you should check this out because it is something that Docker has worked on that I think is really understated. And I don't know any distributed application at the moment that straight out of the box has this functionality that works. Um, so not only is like the the raft consensus being encrypted, um, that keys then and CA is being shared. Um, worker nodes then get the key. Um, the other thing that worker nodes can't do, that on Kubernetes, um, obviously you can't do either, is um, because you need Kube Patrol to actually access the cluster. But on Docker Swarm mode, you can type Docker commands on a worker node. By default, it's got least privileged access. 
So you can't even um, question from a worker node how many nodes are in the cluster. Won't let you. It's got no privileges at all to any admin functionality. That even includes just questioning like simple facts about it. You can only do that from um, the the master node. Um, so that is like they've really, really thought about probably more the enterprise grade clients. They've really thought about um, the UX for, um, side of things, about how to make things really simple. Um, like you can literally set up a small mode cluster in about 30 seconds. Um, Kubernetes obviously takes a bit longer, but there's more flexibility with Kubernetes. Um, what, by making this more secure by default, and also taking away some of the um, flexibility of it, it's very opinionated. And that's the only way that they could do this. Um, so it doesn't give you the flexibility that you might want with Kubernetes, where you can cho choose the like, networking stack. You can um, choose what you want to do with etcd. You might actually want to shard that off and use that for application as well to get key values from it or something like that. Um, all that flexibility that's with Kubernetes um, is not there with Swarm Moon. It's opinionated. and. They've done that for a, a very simple reason, that they wanted the UX to be really good and they wanted the security by default to be really good. Um, they couldn't do that if it wasn't as opinionated. Um, so how the application looks. Um, it looks fairly similar to um, the Kubernetes way, because it's YAML, but it's actually not hierarchical. Um, it's a flat file that has all your services um, that call each other um, by default. Um, so this is the only way you can deploy services across the cluster. Um, and it's, just, it's, it's really basic. And again, I think they've gone for um, a really simple UX in, um, experience that someone can pick it up really easily and go, um, Redis needs DB. Um, this is what we want. This is the constraints we want. And that's all we're going to do. Um, there is a lot more options that you can put in there. Um, but yeah, you, it doesn't have the, the hierarchical sort of um, attributes that Kubernetes have where you have deployment services and pods. Um, but again, it will get um, nodes into a desired, um, sorry, containers into a de desired state. So Redis, you could put, you want replica of two, there'd always be two running. If one died, it would respawn another one. Um, so very similar to the Kubernetes way of um, looking at HA. So the networking layer, this is where it gets quite interesting. Um, we'll go to Kubernetes first. Kubernetes has a massive ecosystem. Um, of networking providers, absolutely massive. Um, you can pretty much do anything on the networking layer on Kubernetes. Um, so if you look at Contrails from Juniper, it understands native Juniper VLAN um, tagging and BGP. Open Contrails, the open source version of it. Um, Flannel, again, has got a heap of functionality around it. Um, I won't go through all of these. Um, that was kind of the first sort of networking stack for Kubernetes that was external of Kubernetes, also made by CoreOS. Um, you've got Contiv, which is open source. Um, you've got Caligar that does BGP. Um, there's a whole heap. So if you have any networking needs um, that are really super complex, Kubernetes can handle that for you. There's no issue at all. But again, with that Kubernetes um, complexity comes responsibility and configuration. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, I, like, I, I think this is a really good way to go. Um, but again, understand the stack that you need understand your use case and understand your business model and what you're trying to achieve, and then um, understand the choice you made and learn that technology. Um, because between the different networking providers, it's hard to swap and change with Kubernetes. Um, it's not super easy to rip one out and do another one. Uh, it'd probably be easy just to build a new cluster, uh, migrate it across and do like a kind of some sort of a blue green um, and, and things. But one of the things that Kubernetes really um, is about and relies on is the fact that it's an ecosystem. Um, Docker Swarm is kind of like part of a platform, Docker's platform. It's their ecosystem that's internal to them. Um, so there's not many other providers writing network plugins for Overlay. Um, but Kubernetes has created the CNI, which is an open um, initiative for container networking, and a lot of people have made networking um, providers for it. Um, so yeah, as I said, I personally, I, I think that the, the choice of networking providers is really awesome. Um, so you, depending if you're like a massive telco that needs BGP to like route stuff from internally to externally to understand the routes through the container network for services for something like SIP, um, Kubernetes can do that. Um, if you want to just have VLAN tagging to go all the way through from your um, like physical networking, uh, Kubernetes can easily do that. Um, so yeah, that's really powerful. And the fact that you can do more complex networking 
on a more granular level in Kubernetes um, is, is a really interesting idea, especially if you're doing multi-tenancy clusters or you're looking at deploying multiple applications in a multi-tenant environment. Um, you can do it with Swarm Mode. It uh, doesn't give you the granularity that Kubernetes will with any of these products. Um, it's just like kind of a, a more of a flat network scheme. Um, and some of these providers as well, they support VXLAN and uh, encrypt it between um, nodes. Some of them don't. And then Kubernetes Ingress um, is pretty, pretty easy. It kind of works like if you know AWS, the Ingress path. Um, you, you don't have to use this, but you can. Um, it will do layer seven routing for you. Um, and that pretty much goes internet ingress services. Um, there's other applications that you can use. I just went for the default one. Um, Kubernetes, as again, is an ecosystem. There's other front ends you can use for it as well. Um, but I just went with the, 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 the actual Kubernetes ingress. Uh, Kubernetes uh, DNS service discovery is kind of um, one of the things that if I got to change something in Kubernetes, this would be it. Um, I would actually, by default, out of the box, have this built into Kubernetes um, installing, not as part of the add-on on manager, but as part of like um, Kube API, Kube proxy, because um, this kind of like needs to be there. Um, it's like, y y yes, you have a cluster up, yes, you have an API that you can deploy to, but if you deploy an application and can't find each other, it's kind of useless. Um, so I would have this as part of actually the, the core, core part of Kubernetes. Um, but that's, that's kind of the flow. Um, it's an externalized application that sits inside the um, cluster. It works as a deployment, so it runs on every node. Um, it'll spin itself back up. And it's actually got three containers in it, so it's got a sidekick, DNS mask, and the DNS server itself. Um, the, the actual traffic goes to the Kube, uh, pro, um, Kube API and then to the DNS record and back out. Um, and yeah, namespaces and services. Um, it works fairly well, but as I said, I, I would like to see it as, as part of the core Kubernetes offering, um, not something that add-on manager um, looks after. Um, you can get into um, some issues with Kube DNS not working after deployments. Um, there's some open issues on KOps about that and a few other things. Um, but yeah, I think this would be best moved into the actual core parts of Kubernetes, but that's just my opinion. Um, other people would have, might have a different opinion. Um, so choice two with Docker Swarm Mode is the Docker, ne Docker networking stack. Um, so basically it's overlay. By default, again, opinionate it. Um, again, it runs on um, the Raft um, distributed store that is not looked after by you. And again, it is um, encrypted by default. Um, in saying that, it's, um, of course it's very opinionated. It doesn't, it's not as flexible. Um, so there is an application by um, Cisco that's been just released or um, was just released at DockerCon um, that can actually plug into Overlay. There is an actual network API um, and they're the first people to jump on it. Um, so that will be able to understand uh, Cisco native VLAN tagging and any of the routing on the Cisco side that you want to pass through. Um, but out of the box, um, Docker only has Overlay um, and Overlay VXLAN. Um, so this is basically what it does. It creates Docker Zero, creates a VEATH and talks to each container and it exposes the VEATH as ETH zero inside the container. Um, um, and then if you want to use VXLAN, this is what VXLAN does. Um, it just does an eight to 11 Q, um, one Q trunk and through to each of the Docker containers. Um, this actually works really, really well. And it, um, if you're going through like a compliance audit, um, this is super easy to set up and it's super easy to get a compliance across it. Um, if you look at like something like the, one of the providers for CNI, it's harder to explain what that's happening and there's a third party application talking to it. And then you'll start, um, start to get questions around the interface, how it talks, how that traffic's encrypted, whatnot. Um, so again, Docker's spent a lot of time making this secure by default. Um, but again, it, but to make it secure by default, it has to be opinionated. So there is a, definitely a use case for this. Um, some people don't need the complexity of like all the stuff that the Kubernetes uh, network can do. It might not need any of the um, BGP, might not need any of that. They might not just want to have like six or seven different like um, LANs inside the Docker Swarm network uh, and they'll be on their own IP addresses. Services don't need to see anything besides what's on that, on that LAN segment and this will do the job perfectly. Um, and it's one command to set it up. So yeah, it, 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 there's a, there is a real use case to use this um, and not, not take on the complexity of like the Kubernetes networking. 
um, because it all comes down to really um, business decisions around um, how big your team is, what skill sets you've got in-house, and what, um, what deadlines you have around what you're trying to do, uh, actually deploy on top of the cluster. You don't want to spend all your time admining the cluster or not actually making improvements on the cluster itself. Um, Docker DNS service discovery is, um, from my point of view, um, a lot simpler and easier to set up and get it working. It just works out of the box. Uh, so on 127.0.0.11, there's a DNS server on, in every container. Um, that address then is mapped to the service and the container name, and that's stored in the Raft consensus store. That's all looked after for you. Um, so as soon as you have Swarm mode enabled, uh, the DNS service discovery set up. You don't need to do anything. Um, and that's just out of the box. Again, um, you can't actually really do much to the DNS server like you can with Kubernetes. Like you can actually go in there and you can actually add records. You can actually um, curl it. You can get a whole heap of responses out of it. Docker, you, it's, you kind of can um, through a gRPC interface, but it's not supported. It's really difficult. Um, they wanted to make it kind of closed and simple to use and opinionated, but again, um, it hasn't got the flexibility, but it'll, this will work out of the box. This works flawlessly. It's probably one of the best things built into Swarm mode that I like. Um, it just, yeah, it's, it works really, really well. Um, the other thing that Docker has that uh, the Ingress does is uh, mesh routing. So basically, you can hit a service on any one of the nodes in your Swarm cluster, and it'll route the traffic to where the container is. doesn't matter if it's on that node or not. Um, kind of what Ingress does on Kubernetes, um, except you don't need another service or set up another um, pod to do it. Um, it's just turned on by default. And again, um, this is really cool. It's out of the box works. The only confusing thing, uh, this originally when it was released was called HTTP mesh routing. It's not actually HTTP or HTTPS mesh routing. Um, it can only do single port. Um, so if you've got two services running on port 80 on each node, you need to do something to handle the layer seven traffic above that. Um, this will not do that for you. It only understands you can only have one port. Um, so either 80, 443, um, if you've got two, it, it doesn't understand. It will actually just like, it could go to any of the nodes that respond. Um, so it doesn't understand that. Um, there is a project from um, Evan Hazlett that works at Docker that is called Interlock. It will actually sit there as a, a service that will uh, listen to all the swarm events and it has an Nginx cluster on top of it. When something migrates or moves, it then um, updates Nginx, so when the request comes in, it handles the HTTP headers and points to the right port. Um, so Docker did change the name of this lately to mesh routing because when they released it at DockerCon 2016, they said HTTP mesh routing, and people were like, awesome, put heaps of port 80 servers on it, and they're like, oh, this is not working, and they're like, oh, it's not actually HTTP if you use more than one HTTP port. Um, so they've made it mesh routing, which it actually is. Um, Again, it's opinionated, but again, this is like one command run swarm in it, and this is all working. So everything I've spoken about um, is just one, one command. Persistent storage. This is actually a really, really interesting conversation to have. Um, I'll speak about Kubernetes first. Um, Kubernetes actually believes that all clusters should be stateless. Um, and Google are talking about it, and you talk to anyone, they say they should be stateless. Yet they actually have the best options for persistent storage out of any orchestrator. Um, so, although that they say that it, it should be, and that's probably what they um, internally do, um, they know not everyone can be like that. Um, so they've got the um, host path, of course. Um, they've got cloud vendors. So there's a cloud plugin for Kubernetes that understands um, GCE and AWS. I hear Azure is coming now that Brendan Burns is um, at AWS. Um, sorry, Azure. Um, it understands internal clouds like OpenStack. It understands Swift. It understands um, VMware storage. Um, and, it and there's third-party ecosystem tools built around it like um, Portworks that it can be an intermediary API um, that can talk to these if you don't want to use the native cloud providers. Um, so although they say that all containers should be stateless, they also have a really good ecosystem around what it can use. Um, Docker Swarm mode. Unfortunately, at the moment, Docker Swarm mode only supports NFS and host path. Um, Docker has actually acquired a storage network, uh, a storage company. Um, they have stuff coming that's in the works, um, but it's not been released yet. So they are a little bit behind the eight ball. Um, talking to them at DockerCon this year, one of the first things that they're looking at is an image cache that sp um, spans the Swarm cluster. Um, because one thing Kubernetes does and one thing that 
Docker Swarm does is there's not an image cache that's cross node, which is super annoying because you have to download the same container on every node, um, or the same image on every node. Um, so I think that that'll be a real value add. And then from there, I think they're going to build it up um, to have some more native um, sort of persistent storage. Um, but at the moment, I see um, the people at Docker are actually working on an image cache that's across the cluster. They see that as the biggest issue, um, not actually persistent storage. There was actually a really, really good application called Flocker um, that was out by Cluster HQ, and unfortunately, they solved this problem before everyone else thought it was a problem and went bankrupt. Um, so they actually had a really, really good um, application that was Kubernetes or um, Swarm mode agnostic. It spoke to all the cloud providers and would actually create like an EBS volume. You could attach your container to it. If the container, then that host died and the container spun up on the other, another node, it would attach to the same EBS volume, um, which was awesome. I actually used it in my past job. And I thought this is one of the best things ever. And that I had not many people use it because like, although it was kind of like an enterprise product, um, there's not that many people using containers in production yet that have seen that this is an issue, and they kind of solved the problem way before anyone would pay money to say, actually, I have this issue, um, which was actually really sad. It's um, still open source. It's still on GitHub. You can use it, but it's just not under support. Um, how about Rexray, the pluggable architecture that EMC came up with? You can pretty much plug every possible storage array into any Swarm node, worker node, yep. and then there's a, like an extension separate that allows you to configure it as still a false path. Yep. So um, there, there, there is Rexray. I've heard really bad things about it, to tell you the truth. So I I'll, I'll do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've, I've not heard good things about it. Um, the guys from um, AMC Australia that are on the open source have been trying to get me to test the pages. Um, but yeah, we haven't used it yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could add, yeah, could have re add Rexray. I have heard of it, um, but yeah. So I've, what do you see in practice? I mean, from from the perspective of real world, largest on prem, not public cloud deployments. What do you see people using NFS? Um, so I see people using um, creating LVM volumes on NFS, and then using Device Mapper to to map across that. That's what I see on internal. So just two different mount points, and then okay. yeah. So yeah, real, real low level primitive sort of yeah. networking stuff. But yeah. Um, so one of the I'm actually working with a hardware vendor at the moment. Um, to install UCP on top of their hardware, and um, that's what they're going to be using. They're going to be using um, different mount point, mounted as an LVM volume, and then let the engine do um, thin pooling across the top of it for, for, for the Docker, for, for Swarm. For it to use the conversion Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what, that's what I'm seeing um, customers use. Um, yeah, but yeah, there is Rexray. I should, yeah. should probably add that. Thanks. No, that's all right. Um, so what's the best tool for the job? I, I'll ask you. I don't think there's a right and wrong answer. Um, really look at your business use case. Look at the team and skill set you've got. Um, and then also look at what you're trying to solve. Ask, your question, ask yourself that. Try, I know at the moment there's a massive religious debate about Docker and Kubernetes. Um, and like they're kind of like being the Twitter thing and all that. But try to step back from that. Actually have a look at your business value. Um, what you're trying to achieve. Um, the complexity that you want to take on. Um, all these should, should go into like, the design decision of what you're um, using. And there could be possibly um, a use case in your business where you use Swarm from one application and Kubernetes for another. Um, it could be possible. I'm not saying that that would be something that I would do. I would probably standardize on a container orchestration, but th th there's no right and wrong answer to that. Um, and at Puppet, we have both covered. Um, so we have modules written that will control Kubernetes, um, that is at the moment, I'll show you actually the first demo of that ever. Um, and that will be released to PuppetConf this year. Um, we also have Docker Swarm modes already out and on Puppet Forge, and we have um, Docker UCP or Docker Data Center already out on the Forge as well. Um, so no matter what choice you make, um, we, we support it. Um, my team actually looks after all the modules to do all this. Um, so if you have any feature requests or anything like that, um, just let me know um, and we'll look at it. Um, and internally in public, we actually have just decided we're actually going with Kubernetes. Um, so that, that was, we, we went through all this, tested all of it, and decided which one we'd go with, and Kubernetes was the choice that we made. So that's, that, that was the right answer for us um, for, for various different reasons of the applications we were deploying, um, the, the complexity of what we needed, and the, like back end, and having to be agnostic of both cloud and internal. 
um, Kubernetes seems like a really good play for us. Um, so I should show you a quick demo. Um, this is nothing really that exciting. Um, actually, I might I might not demo because the internet actually is a little bit on the slow side. Um, I probably should have done this. Um, but, but this is basically, we're controlling like Kubernetes. Um, the Kubernetes module that we're going to deploy will handle all the TLS out of the box for you. Um, whether you want to um, use a CA, external CA or an, um, hard code the, um, the cluster, uh, sorry, hard code the certificates as a, as a file type. Um, we'll also look after um, the management of all, all the actual Kubernetes parts. Um, we'll have uh, options to install um, the network and provided that you want um, with one single parameter. We'll also, do you want the kube DNS, uh, sorry, the kube dashboard, um, all the sort of bells and whistles that go with it will be a parameter, yes or no flags. Um, and this will basically be a supported module from Puppet. Um, so if you have issues with the cluster, uh, also obviously configure etcd. Um, if you have any issues with the cluster, you can actually get support from Puppet if you're a PE customer, um, which is a, a really good value add. Um, at the moment, this is just going to install a whole heap of packages. Um, I probably should have kicked this off a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, but I think there's a, a, a real strong um, method for, um, I think there's a real good play for us um, because setting up a Kubernetes cluster from an operations point of view, like an SRE point of view, is not the easiest task. Um, and there is, like I said, spoke about the complexities. Um, so we're trying to abstract the complexity of, of building the cluster um, and parameterizing that and making it more um, user-friendly than, than Kubernetes to install is at the moment off the bat. Um, and as I said, the, the story that I went through tonight was the testing that we did um, about which one would go with. Um, and as I said, um, we, we put it all together and we, we actually went with Kubernetes internally. Um, and that was for a few different reasons. Um, but that's, that's, I won't go through the different reasons why we went through it. Um, but we, we did test swarm mode um, as well. Um, the one, actually probably one of the biggest facts is probably we, we wanted to make ourselves agnostic of, um, so as you can see here, it's just going to install Docker 112. Um, we want to make ourselves agnostic kind of of a vendor. Um, the fact that Kubernetes most likely is not, uh, Kubernetes is not a vendor product. It's actually owned by CCNF. Um, and it will very shortly probably run on top of ContainerD and run C, which again, uh, open source technology is not owned by a vendor. Um, as we also ship software, we didn't want to be tied down to another vendor's release cycle for us. Um, and yeah, Kubernetes is completely not vendor related, although there's different vendors um, supporting it and, and, and kind of um, developing against it. There's no one vendor that owns Kubernetes. They're like, there's no one vendor that owns ContainerD or Run C. Um, so this is just installing the package from app. Um, it's using Kubelite to do a systemd service. Um, that will control the cluster. Um, it's just going to wait now until the cluster API is up. Um, once the API is up, it's then going to install kubedns uh, and then kubeproxy as well. Um, and then that, that's it, the cluster will be there. Um, so with that one command, I just type it up. It automatically deployed the server for me um, and deployed Kubernetes. Um, and that's all the work we did. Um, the, the, at the moment, this is alpha, as I said. Um, so some of the parameters are still hard-coded because I'm still developing this. Um, but by release time, there'll be just a few parameters, probably about, actually there'll probably be about 30 or 40, uh, 30 plus parameters that you can choose to configure, or I'll put some same defaults in there of stuff that most <coughs> people won't, won't, won't want to um, like configure. Um, and I wanted to give it the flexibility that Kubernetes has if you want to be a really advanced user. Um, but then if you're um, only new to Kubernetes, it would just work out of the box. Um, so that's some of the UX stuff that I've been working on the module. Um, as I said, this is going to depend on how quick the internet is here. It's just downloading all the containers it needs. Um, so it might take a second. Um, on the, while I'm doing that, I'll just build Swarm on the other side. Uh, on Ubuntu. You can see as well, um, straight out of the box with Puppet Code, I've just, um, there you go, Kubernetes is built. Uh, Uh, so if we go, go. Oh. 
I did mean get, not get. There you go. Cubemaster's ready. So simply typing, like spinning up a box and automatically deploying the, applying the class Kubernetes to that box, Puppet just installed Kubernetes. Um, that's one of the easiest installed Kubernetes I've seen. Um, and that's one of the things I've really been working on um, because I think there's real value in that um, to abstract some of the complexity. For, for, for most people, I think that they're not going to need all the complexity um, and configuration that's there, um, but I want to allow them to do that as they grow um, or if they need to grow. Um, again, it's just installing Swarm on the other side, it's Swarm mode and going to deploy a service. Um, again, I've just applied the Docker class with some Swarm configurations. Um, so I've just um, applied the listening address and the advertised address, and this will build the cluster for me. So again, with Puppet, like, we're really working on um, taking out the complexity of like, cluster orchestration and really, really working on um, being able to make it um, easy to use for anyone that uses Puppet. Um, so even though um, you, you've used Puppet before and you might be new to Docker or you might be new to Kubernetes, through the same language that you've used to define all your other infrastructure, you can now define more advanced tasks in cluster orchestration. Um, and through reading the code that we've got, you'll be able to understand it in biosmosis, learn more about that product itself than having to go to the GitHub repo or use something that Kubernetes has at the moment to deploy it. Um, so I think that's really powerful. Um, while that's running, I'll take any questions. That failed because it can't connect to our public web repository, which is not good. Um, like for Kubernetes, there are a lot of provisioning tools. There's like there's a uh, Minikube, there's Chaos, there's a lot of Terraform modules. So you're saying the module that <coughs> Puppet Lab is building is very like, for people that are familiar with Puppet? Yeah. So um, we're, we're, we're trying to first of all, we're trying to um, get ourselves as a, a like um, partner with people um, to get into the container market. Um, so we're actually um, talking to Google at the moment and some people in CCNF to get our like, stuff on to the Kubernetes website. Um, this is more for people that are using Puppet that want to go to, to there, but we're hoping that also we're drawing new customers with the, um, the ease of use of this particular module um, compared to something like Terraform. Um, Minikube is good for development. Um, um, so basically what I've kind of ripped off um, in this module is I've taken the bits I liked on Kops, the bits I liked on Kubeadmin, and Kubernetes itself, and I've taken the, all those bits I liked of those three projects and put it in Puppet Code. Um, so yeah, the, the shortcomings that either all of those had, um, again, I probably could have contributed to those products, but then it would tie our module release to that particular, so we, I, I wanted to couple that. Um, and that's the only reason I didn't, didn't um, contribute back to those products, because um, I wanted to decouple and not have a, a reliance on someone else's development cycle to ours. Um, yeah. Could you could correct me if I'm wrong? But that, if I'm not mistaken, um, does install package upgrades. It's more of like a mutable upgrade. Something like many years ago, there were pack package managers. So Puppet is beautiful server client architecture that allows you to kind of like make sure that your app is up to date to the developers requirements with their pre rex changes for example. While say Terraform or someone else just basically does what a builder would do. It's just completely rebuilds the image towards the destination platform. And it can plug it into the canary scenario and you can have like a gloss break button to roll back. Um, how does the rollback work with Puppet when it comes to containers and updates of the prerequisites. So how does you how do you ensure? Do you do you rebuild from scratch as well with all the plugins for say Kubernetes or like Docker Messes? Or the prerequisites updates would go through the client within the container which which has to be part of the image. Um so are you talking about the application running on top of yes. the 
Yeah. So, so we're not playing the. Uh, we do have a module that will deploy pods on top of Kubernetes, but I don't see that there's real value for us at the moment to play in that. Um, that would be something that like a CD process should play in. What we're worried about is the state of the cluster. Um, the version of the cluster, updating the cluster, the security controls around the cluster, all the stuff that between the cluster and the OS, that's what we care about. Um, upgrading the cluster, um, rolling updates of the actual Kubernetes yes. binaries and stuff, that's what we care about. Any of the sort of pod deployment that's not uh, core Kubernetes like functionality like kubeDNS, kubeproxy, kubeAPI, um, Puppet at the moment doesn't, we shouldn't care about that. Okay. Um, we're looking more from the operations point of view or the SRE DevOps point of view behind yeah. it and the apl actual applications itself Although we have a module that can control it, um, there's a lot of functionality built into Kubernetes to do this um, that's already there. We don't want to play with that because it's, it's good. That, that, that was my question. Thanks for answering. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't want to actually... There is a clear line. Yeah, yeah. So we play below the Kubernetes API. Uh, another question. You talked about upgrading the cluster. Um, have you looked at the uh, boot cube from CoreOS, like the self-hosted uh, Kubernetes deployment that was rolling updates of Kubernetes itself? No, but uh, Tectonic? Um, I think Tectonic is using it, but like, um, so the, the idea is to like bootstrap a, uh, like to create a bootstrap for <coughs> Kubernetes cluster that then boot, bootstraps the, the, the cluster itself. And then if you do need to upgrade the version, it kind of upgrades. Uh, I, I, no, I haven't. I haven't. That's yeah. a that, yeah. That's yeah. might be interesting yeah. also. But it's from CoreOS, so they do like mostly like immutable. So it's basically Kubernetes managing Kubernetes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's some other there's some other cool things I've seen um, from Kube Admin using Linux Kit as well for, for fully immutable. Um, so yeah, this is some inter interesting stuff around Linux Kit as well um, from Docker. Um, Linux Kit is one of the best projects I've seen for a long time. I really I really enjoy it. Um, there's some cool stuff that can be had. Uh, so around that whole really immutable infrastructure, um, I don't have any answers to where we'll play it in that in that space. Um, but this is more towards people that are already running like Sen uh, and stuff. Um, Going to the customers that I speak to, there's not a lot of people that are running CoreOS um, right. that we see. So, so my understanding is that, like, basically, your module allows to have like a couple of roles within Puppet. So you would say like one machine, like all seven machines within Puppet. Uh, sorry, Kubernetes masters, and then like the rest of the fleet is, is supposed then to be blockers. Yep. And what what are you trying to achieve is basically like integrating the rolling out Kubernetes cluster into the usual puppet run. Yep. That's that's your aim, right? Yep. Um, so my my question would be then it's a, a bit related to the previous one for so, so if we if we run a sufficiently large cluster, like a couple thousand pounds, um, and then obviously we want to have uh, all all usual things within within our deployment. Like for example, we would want to have a canary deployment of new version of the Kubernetes uh, management, uh, and then having the whole stack of tests run through it before we actually roll it out. Um, are you aiming to like? With your, with your module, are you aiming to simplify um, that? that? Everything you said, what you said about testing, so we won't ever look at yeah, testing the cluster. Um, yes. Do so, so basically, my, my idea would hopefully that we would be able to use um, something like Hira to extrapolate and say, no, say you've got seven, the first two nodes are going to be this version of Kubernetes, the other, and, and upgrade. Um, and then you would have to externally run your tests. And then on the next run, if the test was successful, um, you could have like a webhook that would then upgrade the other uh, the other nodes. Uh, okay, like that. I, I, I think this is not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is, say we like we have our applications run, and then we want to partially like do do that. Then on the, on the say, sorry, on the cluster or the applications? On the cluster. Yeah. Now we obviously would want to make it so that we don't have to shut down the application. Yeah. Um, so we need a kind of rolling update, um, and I wonder. I just don't don't quite really, don't quite understand how you can achieve this with the pop. I, I I guess like let, let, let me help here. I, I guess the core question is you want to 
you have a cannery off and upgrade to yeah, off yeah, the sure. entire this is, this is what I meant. Kubernetes yeah. cluster. But there are dependencies within the cluster, the cluster. that are not easily yeah. kind of cannerable. There are single points. Was, yeah. So you really have to have dev UAT separate. Yeah, that's not what I want to have. So, uh, I think it's easy, right? <laughs> yeah, well, sure. The, 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 the architecture of Kubernetes itself is prohibiting the cannery um, testing for certain functionalities that are cluster-wide uh, critical dependency. So you basically cannot, within the orchestration layer that Puppet provides or any other vendor provides, you cannot just upgrade a piece of Kubernetes cluster, test it, and then roll back. What is it's uh, I'm, I'm either, but I'm pretty okay. sure what, that there is a single I, point. What I mean is, say, suppose I, I define in here somewhere like that I want to have in that side, I want to have a different version, and then I would probably be able to pass the, the variables through your module into into actual other ground. Yeah. Right? This this is this that would be the expectation. Yeah. Uh, and then I want of course <laughs> from from the host I want then have to, to have an ability to inform the application in the about what I'm running on right now. Like this is a canary deployment of Kubernetes. The usual way how in, in, you, you would do that in a Docker universe, you would pass the variable from the host into a container. And so my question would be, and I'm just now thinking out loud to be honest, uh, my question would be, would you support something like that within your module? Or like, did you, did you, did you ever think about something like that? Not really, because I don't quite understand what you're doing. So you take away Puppet itself. So if you did an application of like Kubernetes, uh, an upgrade of it, and say you use kubeadmin, for example, and then you wanted to tell your application running on top of it, how would kubeadmin know to tell your application? You can cast the environment variable from Yeah, but that, that but the environment variable, what, in the pod? Within, within the pod yeah. But the pod deployment's not what we're looking at. So we're not looking at pod deployments of your yeah, application. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that. It wouldn't matter if it was kube admin or it wouldn't matter if you were using chaos. Um, the the underlying infrastructure um, bit that you're talking about is not the concern of this module, nor would it be of chaos or kube admin. Um, that would be passed as an environment variable through the pod to have a look at maybe the Kubernetes version. So that would be something that your application logic would have to know, not something that this module would support. Because um, I don't think KOPS or kubeadmin would support anything like that either, from my understanding. Yeah, because yeah, I, I don't see a massive use case. Yeah. I think what you highlighted also is the focus on the, um, the management of etcd, uh, yeah. where uh, KOPS and um, I mean, like by default, um, there's not no, not a lot of um, like configuration on the etcd side. And and that would be a focus on the puppet modules as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the things that I'm really focusing on. It's trying to take some of the complexity and um, adding some of the functionality to it. Now, on the first release of this module, it won't be there. But one of the plans I have is to be able to um, implement a backup strategy of the cluster state um, by passing a flag of a snapshot time and some sort of functionality that will do a local snapshot to a, to a node or nodes or an S3 bucket, perhaps. I'm not quite sure of the architecture of how that's going to work, but something similar to like what the raft snapshots are in, in Docker. Did, uh, did you play with etcd operator? Um, no, so I, have, I have seen it, yeah. That, I mean, when you set up an etcd operator, you also specify a snapshot sure. uh, interval and it yeah. basically automate all of it and it does disaster recovery. Like if your etcd cluster loses uh, consensus, it will seed from the snapshot and do a full recovery. Yeah. So it might, it might be something like I could actually use that as uh, the mechanism, but use Puppet to control it, so it's completely hands off. Right, right. Um, so Puppet will will have a look, um, use that, check the backups there, check like everything's like all there. Um, so kind of continually do that for you, but take away the operational overhead of you having to check and stuff. And then like, if the Puppet run fails because the backup's not there, um, you can get a staff notification or something like that from Puppet. Um, we've got a whole heap of infrastructure around that sort of messaging service side. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like making it easy for people to bolt all that stuff together 
um, because at the moment, um, unless you're like fully like in the Kubernetes project yourself and knee deep in it, um, from someone standing outside, that stuff do it doesn't look so easy. Um, and from the customers that I've gone to, because I, I myself took advantage, um, took it for advantage that everyone knew about Kubernetes and, and containers as much as the experience that I had. And then going to actually out to the customers and speaking to people that are trying this, there's some people are really struggling. Um, and it's really hard to get your head around. And when you're inside that bubble, it's like you're like, oh, yeah, I'll just use this and I'll do that and that. But when that's all foreign to you and it's like kind of speaking another language, um, it's hard to get your toes wet and know what you're doing. And that's what I'm trying to look at for like our clients, for example, is writing something but that they can take and look at the code that's in there and by osmosis knowing Puppet can easily read what it's doing and then learn about Kubernetes that way. Um, and then they might move on to something else. They might not use this, this module to control Kubernetes anymore. They might grow past it. They might, they might, not be, they might find out something completely different than they've written themselves. Um, but it, they still used it to learn, um, and that, I think that's kind of cool as well. How about the license model of Puppet? Um, so the license of Puppet itself or the license of this module? Can you, can you look at that? Yeah. So the license of this module will be MIT, it'll be open source and it'll be free. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there's Puppet Enterprise and then Puppet Open Source, so that's a completely different conversation. Um, but yeah, the actual module itself will be open source. Um, module. It's not going to be available until October. October. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be released at public prompt in my public prompt speak. Um, you guys are the first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's only in alpha at the moment. Um, so um, I'll actually I'll actually call out um, to some people um, and try to get some beta testers before October. Um, so if you're interested in that, see Terence and yeah, yeah. Um, we can try to get some people testing it. Um, as I said, you guys are the first to even hear about this and see it. I actually only started um, deploying this module a week ago, developing it, um, because I knew I was coming here and I wanted to do something cool, because I traveled all the way from Sydney. Um, so yeah, I found out I got the Puppet Comps talk, and we had the business decision to write the module, and this is a week's worth of work. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to demo something to kind of show the UX experience and how simple it was. So that was kind of, there's a lot of hard-coded stuff at the moment that I need to parameterize. And I also need to write the part for the worker node. It's not written, only the master. Um, but as I said, that five days work. And I had no ticket at time for that. That was like just doing it in my lunch breaks and stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Thanks. And thanks for having me.